the class tonight is going to be for your four shleima of the Anath Shana's Bat Victoria and the Aliyah of the Nisham of Esther Bat Avraham. Welcome. Friends, I have a million things to tell you. Let's dive in. We are source sheeted up for this class. We want to go deep. It's Hebrew and English. I've chosen choice pieces from the writings of the Rambam, Maimonides. The Rambam, we know, was the only person, which is pretty crazy what I'm about to tell you, in Jewish history who gave us Hilchot Mashiach. Isn't that crazy? The only one who said, I'm going to teach you the laws and the ideas of Mashiach. That's a pretty broad shoulders. It must be a big thing, but no one else did it. And yet he took it upon himself. Friends, we're going to go deep. Because the Rambam discusses Mashiach in a very interesting place. And that is in the laws of kings, Malachim. Why would the Rambam, while discussing kings that we're going to look at, this class, next class, and the class after, you've got to be here, this is a trilogy. This is part one, two, and three, Bezirat Hashem. Why would the Rambam, my dear friends, discuss Mashiach in the laws of kings? I hear maybe in the laws of Israel, maybe, I hear maybe when it comes to discussing uh, religions. But why when it comes to the laws? Or Teshuvah, repentance, because that will bring Mashiach. Why kings? My friends, it's very simple. Mashiach is going to be a king. Kingship, royalty, is going to return to the Jewish people. Now in order, let's just think for just a minute or so. So give me two minute introduction and then we'll jump in. Imagine we have a king, a Jewish king. Where is that king going to be? Which country? It's not a trick question. Israel, yes. Israel, Rabbi. You can shout it out. Eris Yisrael. And we assume the king, the center of kingship, is going to be in the capital of Israel. What is the capital of the land of Israel and has been for the past thousands and thousands of years? Yerushalayim. And where do you think the king is going to put the seat of his power where everything's happening? In the center of Yerushalayim. And that's where he's going to put his temple. That's going to be very important. We're going to be discussing kings we're going to be discussing Israel. We're going to be discussing the temple, the third temple. And this stuff is not just a historic. This is not a lesson in history. This is a lesson of what's happening in the world right now. You are not, my dear friends, going to understand what is happening in the Middle East right now in Eretz Yisrael with all the crazy stuff that's happening to our people and throughout the world, actually, without understanding this basic information. Unfortunately, the Goyim ironically and sadly, have more of an understanding of this information than many Jewish people do. And so I want to fill that gap. By the end of this three weeks, God willing, Bezrat Hashem, Inshallah, you are all going to have so much information that your Shabbat table is going to be full of Mashiach information and your parents are like, oh, you're the rabbi now. You know, they say that like, oh, you're the rabbi, you're the three shurim. And you're going to be like, yes, I am. And I'm going to show you where I got it from. So we're going to discuss... Mashiach. But in order to do that, we need to figure out what's up with being a Jewish king. Because if you don't know what kings are all about, you don't know what Mashiach's about. We're going to look at the words of the Rambam, Laws of Kings, chapter 1. And this is not all of the um, chapters. I've just selected choice parts that elicit much interest and information. The Rambam says that there is a mitzvah, three mitzvot, you have to fulfill upon entering the land of Israel. Now, these mitzvot were given to the Jewish people before they entered into Israel by Moshe Rabbeinu in the Torah. Now, Moshe Rabbeinu did not get to get, didn't get to go inside the land of Israel for reasons we don't need to discuss right now. That's the past. But whatever the Jewish people needed to do to get in that time, we are going to have to do to get in again. You understand? There's a pattern and it repeats itself. When I show you these three mitzvot, you can understand. Number one, they have to choose a king, as it says in Devarim, appoint a king over yourselves. Number one, you need a king, and a king needs a land, and he needs a capital. And by the way, he also needs subjects, right? You need to have subjects. You can't just be, hello, I'm the king. Hey, where is everybody? 
which means the return of the Jewish people to the land of Israel, must precede, must precede the appointment of a king. Because he can't be king with like 15 people surrounding him. That's not kavod, that's not honorable. Number two, he has to wipe out the descendants of Amalek. Now we're going to talk about this nation Amalek, but I'm just going to give you a short tweet as to who these people are. There's never been a nation in world history that have done more to hurt and destroy the Jewish people than Amalek. Now, nowadays, 2024, they're not an entire nation. They've been mixed up among other nations, but they were. And from the moment we left Mitzrayim, in the Midbar, where we were on a high after the Makot, and with Moshe Rabbeinu and Aaron on our way to Sinai, boop, they came to kill us. Chutzpah. And they've been coming after us year after year. King Saul, Shaul HaMelech, had to deal with King Agag, Mordechai, who was the leader of his day, had to deal with Haman. And Mashiach is going to have to finally, completely uproot this evil that is Amalek. You know, there's many people who don't like the Jews. We know that, right? Now we all know that. Everyone knows that. Sometimes they don't like us because they're jealous of us. Sometimes they don't like us because they want our money. Sometimes they want our land. All of that is horrible, but understandable. Oh, no, no, no. Not a Malik. A Malik hates us because we're Jewish and that's it. They will spend money and time and effort when they should be spending money, time and effort on other things just to wipe us out. The classic example which the modern rabbis all agree on is the Nazis with Zera, the descendants of a Malik. They're fighting wars on every front and yet they have the chutzpah and the cheshek and the desire to kill Jews. What are you, Rabbanu Shalom? You're not busy enough. You're fighting the British, right? You're with the Italians. You're, what are you doing? And the Americans, what are you, crazy? Amalek hates us so much, they're going to do everything, divert all the resources, just like Haman did and their descendants. And finally, and most importantly, this is really, these three points are everything we're going to discuss over the next three weeks. Number three, to build the Beit HaMikdash, the third and final temple. We have to talk about that. Because if you're a king, from the days of Shlom HaMelech, that is King David's son, David HaMelech was not allowed to build the Beit HaMikdash, but his, he built the foundations and chose the site. But his son Shlomo, King Solomon, actually did. He was a man of peace, and he was allowed to build the first Beit HaMikdash. It was destroyed 40 years later by the Babylonians, and we were dispersed, that's the whole Purim story. We went back at the time of Ezra, HaSofer, built the second temple. That was destroyed by the Romans. It's laid in ruins for thousands of years. Mashiach's job is to build that third and final temple. I must mention, because it's in my head, I was just speaking to Mrs. Namdar a moment ago about this. Right now, there are plans, and this is causing a lot of anguish, among the Goyim, let alone the Jews around the world. Actually, the Goyim are more excited about this than the Jewish people are. Not all for the right reasons, by the way. In order to have the temple, you need to go up onto Temple Mount to build it, right? You can't get up there without, you know, you can't build it without getting up there. Are you allowed to go up on Temple Mount right now? Yeah. No. Sephardim of Adi Yosef says, absolutely not. Other rabbis say, well, part of it you can go to, you can walk around the edges. You see some people going up there, okay? In 1967, we took control of Harabayat, right? Harabayat, Biadeno, right? It's in our hands. Then, one of the craziest decisions in world history, which I always speak about, Moshe Dayan gave the keys to the Waqaf. These were Jordanians who were running it and said, okay, you can have it now. Rabbanu Shalom. Such a crazy decision, it must be from Hashem. Since that time, we have struggled to control safely that entire area. Okay, we have the Kotel, Baruch Hashem, but the Kotel is an outer wall. You do realize that. There's a mountain that our first and second temple stood on. In order to build the third temple, you need to purify people. How do you purify people, Jewish people, so they're allowed to go up onto all of Harabayat? You need something called a para aduma, a perfectly red cow. It must be completely red. Why? We're not too sure. It's a chok. It's a statute. I will mention, since it's an advanced class, it will be a statute. When Mashiach comes, it won't be anymore. 
we're going to know the reason why the red cow had the ability and has the ability to purify us in order to allow us to get up there. The event hasn't happened yet, so it's a chok, but it will be clear to us at some point. Okay, that's a side point, but it's fascinating. It's like Avram Avinu ate matzah, but he didn't know why. Many years later, his descendants left Egypt with matzah. Oh, that's why matzah should be eaten on Pesach. You see, it retroactively made sense. It may be the same with the Parat Duma. Right now, they've got cows, red heifers, from Texas. They flew them in. And next week, <laughs> like we're living in biblical times, they're planning on killing them and making the ashes you need to purify people. That's crazy. That's not happened in thousands of years. But it's a cow from Texas, not from Israel. It doesn't have to come from Israel. Can't, there's many laws regarding this particular cow. It can't be worked in any way whatsoever. It has to be treated well. Cannot have a mum. Has to have not even two red hairs on it. Uh, two black hairs. It has to, everything needs to be completely red. Fine. It's kosher. It has to be made kosher food in Choslaris as well, right? Mm. Okay. So those are the three parts. So Mashiach's job is to build. This is his job, actually. Not only is his job, it's proof that he is Mashiach to build the third and final temple. Where do we get that from? Because <laughs> that's the job of the king. The king has got to build the Beit HaMikdash. Can you see that? Great. Let's keep going. This killing of a Malik, wiping them out, and by the way, this is if they act like a Malik, they want to hurt us, which we're actually seeing today. It says in the prophet, and it came to pass that the king dwelled in his palace, and God gave him peace from all his enemies. And the king said to Natan the prophet, look, I'm living in this beautiful house, but Hashem, God, is living in the Mishkan. The Mishkan was the portable tabernacle, right? The Mishkan, which had the menorah and the Aaron and the Mizbeach and the other Mizbeach and that we carried around with us. So we had this with us for a long time. And it's like, I'm living in this beautiful palace, which by the way, the era of David, you can still see remnants of it. Down there by Silwan, you know what I'm saying? To the right of the, of the Kotel, which by the way, they're connecting via tunnel right now. I was actually down there, connecting via tunnel. We'd be able to get from one location to the other underground, as was the custom thousands of years ago. And he says, I'm living in this beautiful palace, and Hashem, you're residing in a little tent. Right? That's pretty much what the Mishkan was. It was a tapestry-covered tent. This is not good. So he's like, I'm going to build a bite for your Kodesh Baruch Tremendous Kiddush Hashem. Kavod! Right? You build a Bet Knesset, Kavod. Bet Knesset was a drop in the ocean compared to the past Beit HaMikdash and nothing compared to the future one as well. And so, he says, once you do that, he says, now go and wipe out a Malik. That's what you need to do. You wipe out a Malik, you build a Beit HaMikdash. Same thing is going to have to happen. Mashiach comes, wipes out evil from the world, and then we build a Beit HaMikdash. Since it's a mitzvah to a point, that means one of the 613 mitzvahs in the Torah is to have a king, to have royalty. We're a royal, we forget, we're a royal nation. I know it's hard for you Americans, right? Because you don't really have royalty in this country. I mean, you have the Kardashians, but that's about it. We, well, I come Great Britain, we have Malch. The Rambam says, right? The Moroccans have a king, right? In Sweden, they have a king. Malch, we shouldn't sniff at it. I know we make fun of them, and they do stupid things, and they do ceremony, but you should know. The Rambam says, it adds chashivut. You get to see what Malchut is. Even a, that's why it's a bracha. You make it when you see a king or a queen. Nowadays, we don't do it because they don't really have um, the power of a life or death like they used to. Actually, the president of America probably has more power because he can excuse people on death row over life or death and send people to war, right? So he may have. But kings and queens used to have power. They were very... Jewish kings, I must tell you this, since we're discussing Malchut, were extremely powerful. We're going to see this. They were the judge, the jury, and the executioner. Let's say the king decides to build a palace and your house is in the way of his view, and he wants a direct road from somewhere to his palace, and your house is there, your house is gone. It belongs to the king. That's a lot of power. That's very abusable as well. And by the way, many Jewish kings, I should tell you, abused power badly. They really, really did. Okay. However, although the Torah says, appoint a king, this is important. The reason... We asked God for a king, and then Hashem got upset with us. He's like, why are you asking for a king? And they should have said, because this is the Torah. The reason Hashem got upset with them was because the reason they wanted a king 
Rather than wanting a king, a king is there to make us feel close, like a representative of Hashem in this world. He doesn't have to be the greatest Talmud Chacham. Right? He's got to be someone we can look up to, he can lead us. A king has the ability to bring Kavot Shemayim, right? Because God is referred to as the king of kings, the Melech Malchem Lachim. So you see, like a little king in this world, you're like, I can get a glimpse of what Malchut is. But the reason they initially asked for a king was so that we could be like the other nations. Oh, Mar they have a king. We want a king too. That's not good. Our motivations for greatness should be in order to bring Hashem's name great in this world. That's the reason, my dear friends. Okay? Who appoints a king? How do we get this whole king thing? And remember, this is not history. This is going to have to happen again when Mashiach comes. So the Rambam says the best thing is, well, in Halacha 3, if you want to see, a king may be appointed only by a court of the Shivim Zakenim, the 70 elders. The 70 elders. These were great people. Among them were prophets who had the ability to decide who a king is. They're known as the Sanhedrin. Sanhedrin. Okay? Now, this Sanhedrin kept growing. They had trouble. You know, they have trouble getting rid of the rabbi sometimes. So they kept adding it. Eventually, it became 90 people. Then at one point, it was like 130, maybe even more people. And it started to be called the Ansheik Knesset Dola. But actually, it started as the Sanhedrin. That's really what it started as. That is going to have to happen again. And there have been attempts, even in the days of Napoleon. Napoleon himself wanted to see a 70-nation group of these leaders who were there to appoint Mashiach. That means before Mashiach comes, we're going to have to get together this Sanhedrin, actually. Okay? As well as that, you need a prophet. Now, one minute. Do we have prophets right now? We don't, right? As I always like to say, the Jewish people are no longer a prophet organization. Okay. We will be again. Because the prophets say before Mashiach comes, there's going to be Nevua prophecy that's going to return to all the Jewish people. Says the prophet Joel, you should know it. You, your parents, your grandparents, yourselves, your children. Cholamodru, they're going to see dreams. They're going to see visions. And by the way, I don't think this is so weird. You know, when we left Mitzrayim, Egypt, we we're going through the Yam Suf, there were actually... Everyone became a Navi and Nvia. That means all of your great, 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 great grandparents were prophets. Mm. We are, although we're not Naviim, says the Gemara, we're B'nai Naviim. That's why Jews are successful. We have this little spark inside us and a desire to change the world to be better. That's what a prophet has to do. Is everyone following so far? Marvelous. So who's going to be the prophet in addition to the 130 or 70 elders who's going to Announce Mashiach's arrival. Anybody? Eliyahu Hanavi. Elijah the prophet is going to come. And he has to announce three days when Mashiach comes. Because he's going to the prophet. Elijah the prophet. Last name prophet. Middle name the. And he's going to come. And he's going to say, oh, Mashiach is here. How do we know that? Because the last prophet, in the end of his prophecy, his name was Malachi. Malachi. There are three chapters. And at the end of the third chapter, he says, you should know, right before Mashiach comes, there's going to be a prophet and his name is Eliyahu. And he's going to come and he's going to announce the arrival, which is, by the way, Pesach is coming soon. Which is, by the way, why we invite Eliyahu Navi to a Pesach. What's Eliyahu doing on a Pesach Seder? He isn't there, Rosh Hashanah, as far as I know. He's not invited for Yom Kippur. He's not invited even to the Sukkah. He's not one of the Shev Ushpiz and seven guests, is he? I don't think so. What's he doing? I'll tell you why. Because you're saying, look, we're still thanking Hashem for that first ever redemption, Gula, from Mitzrayim. And we're thousands of years later, 3,135 years later, we're still celebrating it. Bring Eliyahu so we can stop this and have the final Gula. That's what we're saying. We're going to entice him to come, show him, and tell him to announce the arrival of Mashiach. By the way, thinking about it now, if there's a potential Mashiach at any moment, which there must be, because he can come at any time, there must be a potential Eliyahu as well. I never thought of that. That just came to my head. If Mashiach can come at any moment, which we're going to see he must be able to do, because the Gula can come like that, there must be a potential Eliyahu Navi is walking among us. And we know that he takes on the guise of humans. 
puts on, that means anyone know he could be in the room right now? Anybody here? Yeah. You'll deny it anyway. No point even asking. But absolutely, I'm not even kidding you. It has to be. He has to be there and announce his arrival. Actually, there's a fantastic story in the Gemara of a rabbi, Roshua ben Levi, who saw Eliyahu Navi. He was actually dead at this point, so he obviously saw some kind of visitation and said, when's Mashiach coming? And he said, oh, I know where he is. And he told him where to go visit him, and he had a conversation with him. In every generation, at every given time, there must be a potential Mashiach on deck, as we say, ready to go. Bottom of the page, you're doing fantastic, everyone. Okay, she has to be appointed, and just like uh, Shaul and, da- uh, uh, and David were appointed. Now, this king, a.k.a. Mashiach, cannot be a butcher, a barber, a bath attendant, or a tanner. Why do I care? Because he's got to be a leader. You know, this is the reason, my dear friends, that Moshe Rabbeinu had to come from the palace. He had to be, he couldn't be like a, a slave of the rest of us. That's why Aaron Cohen, right, was given the job of Kuhuna. This is Moshe Rabbeinu's older brother, who Moshe actually argued with Hashem for seven days, make him the leader. I don't want to do it. Hashem was like, he was too part of it. He's a very special man. He'll become Kohen Gadol. It's a big job. But leadership has to come from a leadership place. He has to be born into it. He has to have a certain pedigree that comes with the job. So he can't, and the Rambam says, not even for one day. Can he have this low-level job? That one minute is like, you know, selling shoes. Nothing wrong with that, by the way. And the next minute is like, oh, I'm the king of Israel. It doesn't work like that. He has to be chashu. People have to look up to him. He's going to have an extremely charismatic individual. Very charismatic. That's why I can't be Mashiach, because I don't know anything. And also, I used to work in a suit shop when I was at university. So, you know, I lost my job. But that's fine. And by the way, people always, you know, there's many people out there. I don't want to talk about it too much. Because I hear from people daily who think they're Mashiach, right? It's another problem. <laughs> many, many people, like thousands and thousands of people have contacted me over the years. I'm not even you know, joking. Someone actually wrote a book. They typed out and then sent me a whole book threatening me recently about this whole thing because I didn't accept him as Mashiach. I'm not even kidding you. I have photos to show you after as you want to see. I'm not even kidding you. It was sent to the Safra Synagogue office. We had to call the police. Baruch Hashem. Yeah. Complete, complete divonair. Anyway, so the world, the world is full of these people. But I promise you, you don't want to be Mashiach. It's extremely difficult. Imagine, you know you go on vacation with three Jews, what it's like? Organize your class for 30 Jews. You're going to drive yourself crazy. It's too hot. It's too cold. Food is not tasty. You, know, right? you go on vacation. AC on. AC on. Imagine being Mashiach of all the Jewish people. Look what happened to Esther Malka. She almost died on the job. God bless her. Okay. Don't worry, she's getting tremendous half of what she did. Okay. Uh, and he's got to be a appointed king, right? This is not because of an inherent fault, but these professions are less prestigious. So we're going to be a hush of person, right? Okay. Let's turn over the page. We're doing well, we're doing well. When a king is appointed, he is anointed with oil. Now, oil is important, and there's different opinions. Most say he's going to be anointed with olive oil. This, why olive oil? Because it's native to the land of Israel, and oil rises to the top. And so, it's, so oil is significant because it resembles the idea of a person who rises above, because it rises above water. So that's very, very important. Once he is anointed, anointed means they would take the oil, the prophet would do this, pour it in the shape of a crown on his head. That was the way it was always done. Right? That's how Shmuel anointed, and they always anointed, except in the case of Shaol, King Saul, but the other kings were anointed from a horn. A horn in Hebrew is a keren. It's a Karen, also my cousin's name, Karen Hadjoff. Karen means power, koach. It's a sign he's going to be powerful. And, he's got, and by the way, that oil was oil they just pressed. But there was a little bit of oil that Moshe Rabbeinu pressed, and they kept a little bit of it, and they added just a little bit of him. It's as if to say he's a continuation of Moshe Rabbeinu. You know what I'm saying? He's like continuing in the footsteps of his forefathers. Once he is anointed, he and his descendants are... Kings forever. Kings forever. It doesn't stop. It remains in the family for a long, long time. Unfortunately, when the Beit HaMesh was destroyed and we went into Galut, that was lost. So we don't have it. Having said that, my dear friends, I should tell you, there are people alive today who have books that show their descendancy going back. For example... 
many people can trace their lineage to the Maharal of Prague. The Maharal of Prague had a tradition that he came from David Melech, right? Because you have to be a direct line to David Melech. We've kind of lost this along the way, but it's going to have to come back again. I believe that the genetic um, data that we're all part of now, right? They're all consigned up. You know, 23 and me. I go on there, and every time I'm there, I see another 5,000 Persian cousins I never knew existed before, right? So this whole thing of genealogy is actually probably going to be helpful. Right now, they do use it in Eretz Israel to find out if a person's Jewish or not. It's not enough alone. You have to have other sources of evidence, but they add to evidence they have this whole um, verification of a person's Jewishness. Actually, as a side point, one of the jobs of Mashiach, you should know, is to use a special type of prophecy to figure out who is a Jew. Because there's many people walking around today who think they're Jewish and are not, and many, many more people who think they're not Jewish but actually are. And he's going to have a special prophecy that's going to help him detect who is a Jew. And those who are not will have an opportunity to convert, but only an opportunity. After a certain point that we know, that's why you're seeing a lot of converts joining our people, you're seeing that? You're seeing that everyone, like every Bet Knesset has always got like, you know, it's like the United Nations. It all turning up out of nowhere all of a sudden. The cartel is full of people, like, like Asians and African Americans. This is all in preparation for Mashiach's arrival. Because once he comes, it's done. The door gets closed. So this is a, a big opportunity in world history. I'm going to prove to you, by the way, that we're on the cusp of Mashiach coming. We haven't done it yet. But there's very, very clear signs from the prophets. Like, extremely clear. I mean, one of the biggest ones I must mention now, since we spoke about it, is we know the prophet tells us that actually Dovid Melech himself tells us when you see Bonish Yerushalayim Hashem, God is the builder of Yerushalayim, Nidcha Yisrael Yikanes. The ones who are kicked out of Israel are going to return. Say, so what's the connection? And he says, the, the commentators say the connection is when you see Yerushalayim is full of Jews, packed, that you can't even walk through the streets because everyone is so crowded, like Machne Yehuda Erev Shabbat. You know Mashiach is close. Why would that be? I told you, if you're going to be king, you need a large, bustling city. So Hashem is filling up Yerushalayim with people, right? It's the only property in the whole world you can invest in that keeps going up and up and up and up because we can't start moving in. There's a war going on. They're still coming. They can't stop them coming. It's unbelievable. They'll find any way to get there. Okay, so I'm going to just run through this very quickly. Once he's king, his son takes over, then his son, and it keeps going on and on. Are people hot in here? Are everyone okay? Okay, fantastic. We'll do a little bit more. Okay, so he's anointed by a prophet. Elian Navi is going to be a prophet. It's going to continue, and his malchut is going to continue forever. Once Mashiach comes, that's it. The third and final temple, thank you, will stand. <laughs> you got the hint. The five, third and final temple is going to stand forever, forever and ever and ever, and it's not going to be destroyed. First temple, gone. Second temple, gone. Third temple, we're done. It's going to be made and never come down. By the way, the, the analogy that's used, by the way, is Sukkot David Hanafala. You heard that before? Sukkot David. Why do they refer to the Beit Migdash as the Sukkah of David? Because as you know, especially here in New York, a Sukkah can fall down like that, but it can be built like that as well. And that's what it's going to be like. Like a Sukkah that falls and boop, it's up like that in minutes. You're like, how did it get there? Right? How did it get up so quickly? Hashem can do that. Okay, so that's what's going to happen. So he's going to be anointed. We're going to have um, the prophet. Eluah is going to come beforehand. We're going to have the 70 elders who are all there. There's many, many Talmud and Chacham in Eretz Yisrael, which they weren't for a long time. We have the best yeshivas in the entire world, which weren't there for thousands of years, and now there are. The, you understand, in our generation, in your generation, the whole scene, the whole land is prepared, right, for this biblical event to happen. Okay? If, however, the king's kids do not follow in the footsteps of their father, it doesn't pass on. Right? He's got to have at least one kid who's able to continue uh, his um, mission of leading the Jewish people. Okay? So that's important. Let's turn over. I'll add another piece over here. Remember the whole anointing thing with the olive oil on his head? That had to happen at a spring. And actually, you can go now. I've led many trips to Israel. And there's a place called the Gihon Spring. 
and they used to go there, and you see there's running water, right? You see those waters underneath, and they used to go to the gate, and they would anoint the king at that place. Why a spring? Where water comes out. So water represents Torah, en maim el Torah, water, because it always gives life, and water always goes down to the lowest place. So to Torah goes down to people who are humble, right? That's why we stood at the foot of the mountain and the Torah came down like water down the mountain to us. Am um, Israel surrounding the mountain. But not only that, my dear friends, it represents life and vigorous energy. And that's what a king has to be. The king is not going to be like, hello everybody, I'm king of Israel. He's going to be extremely charismatic. People are going to be drawn to him just like they were drawn to Esther HaMalka. You know, everyone loved Esther HaMalka. Every nation would come along, see this Persian princess. I'm in the right place for this. See this Persian princess, oh, right? In the past, you'd be like, oh, she's mine. Oh, she's back. Because she never told them where she was from. She did that deliberately in order to attract everybody and also not to let Haman know that she was Jewish because he would have probably tried to kill her. But she had to keep her um, ancestry silent and a secret. So she was like famous and people say, oh, she's mine. Oh, she's Midian. Uh, oh no, she's Iraqi. Oh no, she's Ashkenazi. Everyone like, she's mine, she's mine. Mashiach's going to do the same thing. Everyone is going to be extremely drawn to this individual. You know, when I was a kid, I remember this. We used to talk in school like, what kind of yarmulke will Mashiach wear? Will he wear a kippah sruga? Will he wear a black velvet yarmulke? Will he wear a turban? Will he wear a fez? Will he wear a strimal? And the answer is, who the heck cares? <laughs> who the heck cares? Rebona Shalom, that's our biggest problem. You know, when I first came a rabbi, I'll tell you a little secret. I used to judge people by their yarmulkes. I used to think, I'm embarrassed to say this, but it's the truth, that people had bigger yarmulkes were more religious. People with smaller yarmulkes were not. Since me being a rabbi for 25 years, I now see there is absolutely no correlation between the size of a yarmulke, right? <laughs> and people's Yerah Shemayim. I see people who sometimes go to work without a yarmulke who have extreme Yerah Shemayim. I see people with big yarmulkes, big kippot, who act, I don't want to tell you. I promise you, and this is true, I don't even notice if a person's wearing a yarmulke anymore. It's so meaningless to me, I don't even see it. Let alone what type of yarmulke, I don't even see they are wearing a yarmulke. I just don't notice it anymore. Unless I'm on vacation, I want to see who I can schmooze with, you know what I'm saying? Because like, you're on vacation, you want to talk to a Jew. Right, besides that, right, I'm like, oh, there's one over there. But besides that, it's so meaningless. In other words, it's irrelevant. We're all going to be attracted to Mashiach. And everyone's going to, the Hasidim will be like, oh, he's like me. And the Yemenites, oh, he's like me. And the Persians, he's from King's Point. Everyone's going to be like, oh, he's my person. That's, he's got to have that magnetic personality in order to fill his mission, right? Okay. Chapter 2. A king must be treated with great honor. A king with great honor. He must implant awe and fear in the heart of all people. You may see me like, wow. You know that feeling when you see a celebrity? Let's be honest. And you meet them in real life. You know what I'm saying? And you're like, oh, wow. Look, it's Tom Cruise. Haven't been mistaken for him many times. I understand the problem. <laughs> Thank you. People feel that way, and I'm about to say, when I see certain celebrities, you know, I still, you know, I was in L.A., and I saw a certain actor who I grew up, he was in a show growing up, and I was like, eh, and all the people are like, eh, it's L.A., we see him all the time. And they're from L.A., so they're all crazy. But that's not the point. The point is you feel it a little bit. You really should feel it. I'm about, if you saw a great rabbi, would you feel that? I don't know. I hope. At this point in life, I think I will, you know. But you should feel that. You should feel that. You're going to feel the same with him. He says, you should see him, and you should, there should be a tremendous awe and Yerushimayim that should exude from him that we feel. Okay? That's why the king who is selected, if there is a king, listen, a king could have many sons who could succeed him. They had to pick the one that people felt in awe of. Okay? You're not allowed to ride his horse, or in our day and age, his Tesla, whatever he's driving. Not sit on his throne. You can't use his scepter. You can't wear his crown or any of his utensils. And when he dies, they're all burned. That's what the Ramam says. You can't say, yeah, I sat in the king's chair. You know, I went to visit London with my family. I was actually there with my son recently, but we didn't go. But the time before that, within the past year, I went to Buckingham Palace. It's worth going to Buckingham Palace. I'm very bare met, going inside. 
you know, they see the, you see a throne, a royal throne. It's a chair, but it's a royal throne. And you look at it and they rope it off. Immediately, I want to jump over the rope and sit on it, you know, and get a selfie, you know, because I'm crazy, right? But it's, it's, you feel the awe. Isn't that weird? A chair? Give you, that's what a throne should be. Actually, Achashverosh chose Shushan as his capital because he built the throne there. It was so big, he couldn't transport it to Babel. So he actually brought Babel, Babel to Paras, to Persia, as a side point. Okay, so it's very important. Okay, you cannot make use of his servants, his maids, his attendants, right? It's absolutely prohibited. Even if one of his close relatives die, he may not leave his palace. When he has served the meal of the comfort for a velut, the entire nation should sit on the ground, he should sit on a low couch. It's constant, all the time. He enters the temple courtyard, and he's of De De David and Melach's descendants, he may sit. Okay? But the other ones may sit at the temple courtyard, as it says, he sat for God. So even he was allowed to sit in the most holy of places. Okay? He should have his hair cut every day. Okay, I can't. But he should. He dresses himself. Now this is, it may sound true. Why does a Rambam care about his hair and his clothing? Why is he, who cares? Let me tell you one quick story. Less of an anecdote, more of an incident. I went to my Rosh Hashiva, and I said, when I got my smicha, I became a rabbi, and I said, I've decided to, you know, work in Jewish outreach. Because my smicha, my rabbinical, some people wanted to work in Kashrut, some became pulpit, some worked in different areas of... Uh, and I said, I want to work in Jewish outreach with people who've had no Jewish background. Please give me some advice. It's my Rosh Hashiva. And he sat down like this. Hey, what's it? I have a piece of advice for you. Make sure you wear a clean suit and trim your beard every single day. I was like, that's it? That's all you got to say? I said, I'm going to work in outreach. Tell me to say this, teach that, emunah, shabbat, kashrut. He didn't say any of that to me. He says, you've got to look the part. You're going to be the first rabbi. Many of these people, that's true. I'm sometimes the first rabbi thousands of people have ever had a conversation with because that's the kind of field I've been working with for the past 25 years and he says if you walk in and you're wearing there's a ketan there's a little stain on your jacket right because that's how you know and there's dandruff over here and you look dis disheveled you're making chaloshem because they look at you they look at you as the only rabbi and you represent Hashem it's a chalol Hashem and so he said to me isn't that incredible and by the way he was also very very careful he was always clean pristine and all his sons would come clean put together. I'll be honest with you, I used to go to yeshiva with old school rabbis, you know, Ashkenazi rabbis, and they looked terrible. And I don't want to be like them, right? That's why being the rabbi was a later choice. He said, you have to look good, you have to look clean and well, because you're representing a Kaddish Baruch Hu. It's a chilul Hashem, actually, that's why a Kohen, if he has a ketim, if he has a stain in his clothing, he could be chayv mitah. It's a big deal. It's a big deal, right? Same with the king. He's not just telling he's got to look good, because, you know, he's got to be stylish. He's saying that he represents something very important. If you're a, you saw a cop or the doctor walks in to treat you and he's got like gravy and cholent stains all over his white jacket, you're like, mm, I don't think so. I don't want to see any blood on my doctor's jacket. I want to see him clean and crisp and looking good. It's something to it. We don't live in a generation where you know, he just turns up with his pair of shorts and like treats you. That's not okay. Okay, that's why it's very, very important. And also, every nation, this is also important. When Mashiach comes, a few more minutes. When Mashiach comes, Every single, it's not just the Jewish Mashiach. He wasn't just the king of Israel. He represents Hashem for all people. Which is why the prophet Isaiah tells us that all the nations are going to stream into the land of Israel to meet Mashiach. Just say so you see all these nations, you know, at the Kotel. I was just there last, two weeks ago. There was a whole delegation from India. I know they were because they all had yellow caps on with the word India on their sweatshirts. <laughs> and they looked Indian. And they're walking around, kavod, you know, holding, praying the thing. You're going to see this ten times more, thousand times more. People coming to greet Mashiach. Ben Gurion is not big enough. I know they increased it. It's going to fill up in a minute. We have a big problem. Don't worry, there's many more airports than there is Israel. And there is Israel is going to be much, much bigger. Another discussion, not for now. The Israel you see now is very small. It's going to expand. This is because, here's the depth to it. Avram Avinu was promised the land of ten nations. When we went into Israel with Yoshua, after, after um, Moshe Rabbeinu died, we only took the seven Canaanite nations. There are three left. Kini, Kinezi, Kadmoni, I think. 
We're gonna get those lands and it probably goes out. Don't tell anyone this. A lot of Jordan, a lot of Syria. Damascus is gonna go right out. It's gonna be much, much bigger. We've got a lot of Jews to fit in there. And Jews need their space, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> All right. Gaza too. Fantastic. What? Gaza too. Gaza too. That's beautiful there, by the way. I was there pre-2005. I was there. The most stunning part of Israel. Unbelievable. It's been a challenge for us since the Philistines, by the way, which is why they called them the Palestinians. Nothing to do with their original res um, residence. They were called Palestinians because the Romans were like, hey, you have a problem with the Philistines? This is Palestine now. That's all it is. There's no Palestinians. It's just a, ra it's just a name the Romans gave us to stuch it to us. They're still stuching it to us. Okay. Very, very good. Great. Let's turn to the page. How long do I have? Shayna, I don't know. When you see them yawning, we'll finish. Okay. There's another Shayna over there asking. Shayna, Shayna part two. What do you want to say? I thought you were talking to me. I was like, uh. <laughs> you should have said now. I would have done it. Okay. Okay. Now remember. Now remember, oh, so I want to go back to that one piece, by the way. So the land of Israel is going to be much, much larger. It's going to include a lot more territory. Every single Jew is going to have to return to the land of Israel. The Goyim are going to come and visit there. Now they do not need to become Jewish. This is one of the myths that I've heard a lot of people think. I think everyone becomes Jewish. As I always say, the Goyim do not need to become Jewish when Mashiach comes. There's just not enough room in Costco for the Goyim as well, you know what I'm saying? We can barely fit in there, let alone everyone else. Someone's got to buy retail. But jokes aside, we need the Goyim because all religions, says the Rambam, are going to disappear. They're all gone. Everyone is going to believe in the one true God of Israel. We do not have a monopoly on God. We have a monopoly on Torah and Mitzvot. But we do not have a monopoly on Hashem. We don't own God. Every human is made B'Tselem Elohim in the image of God. Every human, man, woman, and child, no matter where they're from, can find a true connection to a Karash Baruch Hu. Even according to the Ramam, people come from Zera Amalek. If they don't act, they can actually change their ways. We only hurt them and attack them if they try to attack us as a Malek. But if they don't, we leave them alone. No problem. No problem. And so all these nations are going to return and they're going to see the one true God of Israel and they're going to see that and they're going to stream in to seek advice from the great Mashiach when he arrives. Okay? Let's just start chapter 3 and we'll leave this off for next time. A king has a special mitzvah. A king has a special mitzvah. And that is which no one else has. Okay? That's actually, he has a few. Some negative and some positive. For example, he can't marry more than... 18 wives. You know that? I know. I can barely handle one. And she can barely handle me. The king can take 18. Now, why that is another discussion, it's very, very interesting. But he's allowed to, Shlomo HaMelech, we're told by the rabbis, made a mistake and married many, many, many. Some say a thousand, but that's probably just like an exaggeration to say he had many, many wives. And that was his way of spreading Torah and his see throughout the entire world, which was effective in his day. He was extremely popular. Actually, you should know, in the days of Shlom HaMelech, the Jewish people were at the highest they ever were. You know, they didn't accept converts in the days of Shlom HaMelech because they thought their conversion was only because they were, you know, wanted to be like us. And there wasn't a real uh, pure desire for them to become Jewish. Okay. And so the, <coughs> the king has that uh, ability to attract the people and make them want to become part of, of the Jewish people. That's really what he is meant to be, he is meant to be doing. But he has another mitzvah, and that is to write a Sefer Torah for himself, that he carries with him all the time, and another Sefer Torah that he keeps in his palace. No one has, we have a mitzvah to write a Sefer Torah, but just one. He has to write two. One he keeps on him all the time, and one stays in his palace. Now, how did he carry this around with him? Something he literally carried a Torah. Something, no, no, no. He had people around him, you know, his, <coughs> his entourage, his posse, carried around a Sefer Torah. Right, Ari Kaplan, a great rabbi in the past generation, he said actually he had a little mini Sefer Torah with micro writing, you know, little micro writing things, and he wore it on a chain around his neck. I call it the original Jewish bling. Mm -hmm. right? Why would this be? Because the king is so powerful, 
that he could get away with a lot of stuff. And he has to be reminded constantly that he answers to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Imagine if the president, <laughs> just imagine, carried with him wherever he went a copy of the Constitution before he said or did anything, referred to it. Am I really allowed to do that? Right, that's a big deal. You wouldn't see that. Right? They do whatever the heck they want. That is not the king, and that is not Mashiach. Mashiach is going to be a prophet. The greatest prophet since Moshe Rabbeinu, says the Rambam. Others disagree and say he'll be greater than Moshe Rabbeinu. But even he is going to have to answer directly to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, be a Navi, as though there'll be a lot more Navu on his day, and he's going to have a Sefer Torah with him all the time. He's not coming out of nowhere. He's not coming out of a vacuum. He's coming with history. He's coming with genealogy. He's coming with Torah. Coming with mitzvot. And if he changes even one mitzvah of the Torah, he's not king. Actually, he's probably killed for it. A false fake king? That is pretty, pretty bad. Okay? So that's what he has to do. And everyone has to make sure this Torah is absolutely perfect. Okay? He reminds me, actually, one quick story. Talking of the king carrying a Sefer Torah. A, a friend of mine had to transport the Torah from Eretz Israel to Chutz You know, the Sefer Torah in Eretz Israel are much cheaper. So all the Torahs we have today are written in Eretz Israel. Even the Mezuzot. It's just too expensive to do it in Chutz Laris. Anyway, so he, he was a young boy. He was like 90. He had to bring a Sefer Torah from Eretz Israel. The Bet Knesset or whatever it was asked him to bring it over. So he's walking through the airport. And while he's walking through the airport, he's schlepping it around. And he sees, because he's holding it, he sees there's some food there in the airport. And he, wants to, and he realizes that May it be so kosher. That's hard to believe, but not every restaurant in the restaurant the airport is that kosher. I was actually just there last week. I saw champagne in the airport for an unbelievable price. I was so excited. Moe Chandon champagne. I said, they have kosher Moe Chandon? <laughs> no, it's Treif. I'm not, I'm, I'm not even joking you. I bought a lot more wine, don't worry. I was like schlepping it through the airport. Okay, mm -hmm. right? So he sees this food and he's like, oh, I want to eat this food. He's like, but how can I eat this, you know, not such good hechsher? I'm carrying a sefer Torah. And then he sees a nice girl sitting over there. He wants to sit with her and start schmooze with her. Was she Jewish? Was she not? I don't know. And he's like, how can I do that? I'm carrying a sefer Torah, you know? And then he gets on the phone with his mother and he's talking to her and she starts getting irritated by her, you know, because that's what parents do. He wants to share. He goes, oh, I'm carrying a Torah. All right? He said, all of his behavior changed by carrying the Sefer Torah. Everything changed about him. And then he dropped it off and he went back to the same person he was before. He was actually a big rabbi now. Right? However, at the time, it impacted him very, very greatly. The king does the same thing. He has a Torah all the time, and that keeps him in check. The sheikh is going to be exactly the same. Okay? And even when he goes to war, one of the big jobs of Mashiach, one of the big jobs of Mashiach is to fight the wars of God. The Rambam says, if he fights these wars and wins these wars, you can even assume he is definitely the Mashiach and not just a great Jewish leader. That's one of the proofs that he is actually Mashiach. He's going to have to fight what's called Milchemet Hashem, the wars of God. Now, when I was a kid in Yeshiva, I went to a very, very religious Yeshiva, they would say these wars are spiritual wars. You know, these are spiritual wars. That's what it is. He's fighting spiritual wars against the Yitzhara and this kind of stuff. And you know what? That's probably true as well. But you read enough Tanakh and you read enough Rambam, mm, there's going to be real wars as well. Bloodshed. And Mashiach is going to be part of that. Whether at the front or orchestrating things from behind. As far as we know, Mashiach could right now be advising people, whether they realize it or not, whether he realized it or not, from behind the scenes in order to make sure that we are winning wars right now. There could be casualties on our side of those wars. It doesn't say. Actually, there's someone called Mashiach ben Yosef who actually may die in the final wars before Mashiach comes. That's actually an opinion as well. And so he went, took a Torah, and he was to inspire the troops to say you're fighting God's wars, this is God's land, Eretz Yisrael, and you need to show tremendous kavod, this is an amazing opportunity for you to fight this war to protect the Holy Land of Israel and the Holy Jewish people inside it. Next class, my dear friends, we are going to visit the kings again, see what he owns, see how he uses his wealth and his great success in order to fulfill his mission. We'll do that next time. 
If you want to, you can take these sheets with you, make sure you bring them back, or you can leave them here and we'll bring them back for you. Have a great and successful day. Thank you, everyone.